In this video, we'll learn about the large signal operation of op amps. Specifically, we'll look at some non-idealities that arise when we try to use op amps to generate very large signals at its output. One of these large signal non-idealities is output voltage saturation, which we've already discussed. Although we expect the op amp to provide a large gain for any input voltage, in fact, it can only provide that large gain for a relatively narrow range of input voltages. That's because there's a limit, a positive and a negative maximum limit output voltage that the op amp can provide. Output voltages that try to exceed these limits are clipped due to saturation. In addition to output voltage saturation, op amps have output current limits that also have to be respected. This is best illustrated by way of example. Here we've got an op amp connected in a non inverting configuration with a gain of 1 plus R2 over R1 equal to 10 volts per volt. And we've applied an input sinusoid at VI with a peak value of 1.5 volts. The op amp itself saturates at plus minus 13 volts and has an output current limit of plus minus 20 milliamps. Now, since the input peak is 1.5 volts, we would expect Ideally, the output peak should be at 1.5 times 10 volts per volt or 15 volts, but that exceeds the output saturation voltage of the op amp. So therefore, the output follows the input sinusoidal waveform perfectly as long as it stays within the limits plus minus 13. But when it tries to exceed those limits, the output clips and remains constant at the output saturation limits, plus or minus 13. So that's the story with respect to output voltage saturation. But we also need to consider whether the output current limits of the op amp are being respected. To do so, let's consider a nodal equation here. And we see that the output current of the op amp has two components. There's the current IF that's flowing through resistor R2, and the current IL that's flowing through the load resistance RL. IF is equal to VO minus the voltage on the left side of resistor R2, which thanks to a virtual short circuit assumption is equal to VI, divided by the resistance R2. And then the load current is simply VO over RL. Now, in this particular case, we can plug in some values for VO, VI, and R2 uh, when the op amp enters saturation. So let's consider what the output current that's being demanded of the op amp is at this point here. So here we would find that IO is 13 volts minus the input voltage, which at this point is 1.3 volts, divided by resistor value R2, 9 kilo ohms. That's the current IF. Then there's a second component of current, RL, through RL, which is 13 volts over the value of RL. Now, if we plug these numbers into a calculator, we'd find that the current flowing through R2 in this circumstance is 1.3 milliamps. So in order to respect the output current limits of the op amp, we need to ensure that this second term, 13 volts over RL, is less than the remaining output current limit of the op amp after we take into account this 1.3 milliamps. That is, it's got to be less than 18.7 milliamps in order to observe the output current limit of the op amp. This places a lower limit on the value of RL. RL has to be greater than 13 volts over 18.7 milliamps, which is about 695 ohms in this case. What it means is that if RL is smaller than this value, 
the load current would be so high that the total current coming out of the op amp would exceed its output current limit and it wouldn't be able to deliver that much current. As a result then, the output voltage would actually get limited even below the saturation limit and it would be limited because of its output current limit. One final large signal non-ideality of op amps arises when we try to force it to change its output voltage very, very rapidly. And again, this is best illustrated by way of example. Let's consider this simple unity gain voltage follower here with an ideal step input applied with a amplitude of V volts at the input. Now, assuming the op amp has a unity gain bandwidth of omega T, then the 3 dB frequency of this unity gain configuration is simply given by omega t over the DC gain of this configuration. Remember that a voltage follower is a special case of a non-inverting configuration where R2 is equal to zero and R1 is equal to infinity. So therefore the 3 dB bandwidth of this voltage follower is simply the unity gain bandwidth of the op amp itself. The closed loop configuration has a first order response with a bandwidth equal to omega t. So remember that first order single time constant circuits when exposed to a step input exhibit exponential settling at the output. Specifically, we would expect the output voltage to track the input, that is to settle to an output step height equal to V, just like the input, but it won't step instantaneously. Instead, it'll observe exponential settling with a time constant equal to one over the 3 dB frequency, in this case, one over the unity gain frequency of the op amp. An exponential settling waveform like this exhibits its highest slope right at time zero. At that point, we can find the rate of change of the output voltage by taking the derivative of this expression here and substituting in time t equals zero. Doing so straightforwardly reveals a slope of V, the step height, times the unity gain frequency of the op amp, omega t. And this is exactly what we would observe in the lab, so long as the step height V is not too large. If the step height V gets larger than some limit, what happens is that the slope that's being demanded of the op amp at the output at time t equals zero is so high for large V that the op amp simply can't keep up. There's finite currents flowing in the internal circuitry of the op amp that simply limit how fast its output voltage can be changed. This limit is referred to as the maximum slew rate of the op amp. So as long as the slope at time t equals zero is less than the slew rate limit, then we get the exponential settling predicted by this first order linear analysis. However, if the slope v is large enough, then the slope at time t equals zero will exceed the maximum slew rate of the op amp. And in this case, the op amp circuit becomes slew rate limited. That is, instead of following the exponential settling response, it will increase with a constant slope equal to the slew rate. So the slew rate is actually the maximum rate of change of the output voltage of the op amp in any configuration. It would continue to increase with that constant slew rate until the output voltage approaches very closely to its final steady state value, in this case, equal to the input step height, V. If you were to zoom in closely enough here, you would see that once it approaches very close to its final value, it would resume exponential settling and finish off settling at V. Another case of interest that helps us illustrate the impact of slew rate limiting on op-amp circuits 
is what happens with a sinusoidal input. In this case, let's consider an input sinusoid at a frequency omega and with amplitude vi hat. And let's say that such an input is applied to an op amp configuration that has a gain g. Now for a sinusoidal input, we know that the fastest rate of change occurs at the zero crossings. And the rate of change at these points is equal to the frequency of the input omega times the amplitude of the sinusoid. At the output of the op amp circuit, that would be the amplitude of the input vi hat times the gain of the configuration g. That is, if the op amp circuit is operating properly, it should be producing an output sinusoid with a peak value equal to VO max. And in such a case, the maximum slope at the output is omega, the frequency of the sinusoid times VO max. Now, if VO max or the input frequency is large enough, then this value will exceed the slew rate limit of the op amp. In such a case, the op amp will be unable to faithfully reproduce the sinusoidal waveform. Instead, you're likely to get something like this blue waveform shown here, where the output simply ramps up and down at the constant slew rate limit of the op amp itself. If we want to avoid this situation, we have to ensure that the frequency of the sinusoid and amplitude, output amplitude of the sinusoid observe this limit that's imposed by the op amp slew rate. This upper limit on the frequency that the op amp circuit can handle is referred to as the full power bandwidth of the configuration. Obviously, it depends on the slew rate of the op amp and the amplitude of the sinusoid at the output of the op amp circuit. It's called the full power bandwidth because clearly beyond this frequency, we see that the output waveform is not reaching its full output level, the max that we would expect under ideal circumstances.